All right, so on Wednesday, we were talking about abstract data types, ADTs, and we also just talked about different kinds of collections that you can use in C++ in our Stanford libraries. We talked about vectors and linked lists. We talked about stacks and queues. And today, we're going to talk about some more collections called sets and maps, and your second homework assignment goes up today. Um, I wanted to mention a couple things. So, you know, last night, the layer was pretty popping with people. And, uh, you know, that's typically how it is going to be the night before an assignment is due. There's going to be longer lines and more people waiting to get help. And I know that that's not very much fun for you guys. But I have great news. Uh, you can go to the lair any other day. <laughs> I'm just saying, if you start a little earlier or go on a different day or a different time, there are fewer people there. You can get help faster. A general suggestion is if you start earlier, it'll be easier to get the help that you need. Um, but hey, that's up to you. So uh, homework two also is going to be a pair assignment. If you want to work with a partner, you can. You don't have to, but you can. It needs to be someone who's in your section with you. If you've got a good buddy and you're not in the same section with them, let us know and we can get you into the same section so that you can work together. The reason we want you to be in the same section is because it's really hard to manage who does the grading and who meets with you if you have two different section leaders. That's one of the main reasons. So. Um, in terms of like, just should you work with a partner or not, I strongly encourage it. I think it's a really good thing to do because it gives you somebody that you can talk to and somebody you can help you work through the problems with, figure things out together. And you know this help that you're trying to get in the lair, you're waiting for a while to get help. Well, you got a helper or buddy right there next to you you can work with. I think that that's really useful to just talk through some of your initial questions. Uh, and frankly, just to be really honest with you, it helps us a lot when you work in pairs because everything cuts in half. You know, the number of questions cuts in half, the number of layer people cuts in half, the number of programs to grade cuts in half. And I'm not trying to be uh, flippant about that. I mean, it means that if there are fewer units that need help, that means more time that we can give to each person and more help we can give to each person. So I strongly encourage partners and pairs, if you need help finding a partner, I'm going to post a thread in the Piazza forum where you can look for partners. And just you know, talking to your section leader, talking to the other people in your section, if you need help finding a partner, let us know and we will try to help you figure that out because we want to encourage that. We, we certainly want you to think about that option. Uh, if you have any questions about the pair programming policies, what you should do, what you shouldn't do, or whatever, uh, there's a link up in the top of our website that says pair programming. You might want to read through some of the details there, answer some of the common questions. <laughs> I mean, the, main, the, the only other thing I can think of that I would say about it right now is just I think if you work with a partner, the best way to do it is to work together, like go sit with each other and work on it together. Um, I don't think a good solution is to like split it up, you know. <laughs> you do part one and I'll do part two or whatever. I could sort of understand why some people think that they want to split things up like that. But I mean, look, at the end of the day, you're going to get tested on the same stuff. And so if you've only learned half the material because you only did half the homework, you might not be as ready for that. So I think you'll write better programs and you'll learn more if you work together. So anyway, those are my thoughts on pairs. Did you have any quick questions about that uh, before I switch to the lecture content for today? No? OK. Well, uh, anyway, think about it. So today we're going to talk about some new collections, new ADTs. They're called sets and maps. And uh, hopefully I'll have time. I'm going to teach you a way of talking about algorithm efficiency, which is called big O notation. This comes from chapter five. So let's start with a motivating example. I want to count the number of words, unique, unique words in a file. So you have a big file like the Holy Bible or Moby Dick or a dictionary or something like that. You want to know how many words it has, how many unique words. So like if you have the word the that appears 10 times, I don't want to count that as 10. I want to count that as one. So how do you do it? Well, you know, look, spoiler, I'm going to tell you that there's this cool collection called a set that is good for this. But let's pretend we never heard of that or there's no such thing as a set. Well, we could use some of the collections that we've already learned about. We could use a vector. So let's go try to write that program real quick and see how that turns out. Uh, so I'm going to go to Qt Creator. I've got a project for today. And uh, I've got a file here called sets.cpp. And I'll rename this to say main. So I want to write this method basically called word count that you pass in a file name. And it'll count up the words. And it'll print out how many unique words there were in that file. So I've already got the little bit of code here. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this thing, this library that uh, you don't need to 
know the details of. It's called a timer where I can say start and stop, and then I can ask how much time elapsed. I want to see how long the program took to run, because the faster the better, right? So, okay, this is the file. I want to read it. You guys know how to read files. That's not really the point of lecture today. So I'm just going to write some of that together, or write some of that uh, myself before we work together. So I'll just say, you know, if stream input, input.open file name, right? Read from that file. If I want to count words, if I want to read the words one at a time out of a file, do you know how to do that? I mean, we used get line a lot in the past, but that reads a whole line. I want each individual word. Do you remember a way to read words? What do you say? C in. C in or, or not, not C in, but I think what you mean is the, I think what you're talking about is like C in, arrow, something. Uh, that syntax is the right syntax, but I wouldn't say CN, I would say input. But that, that sort of arrow syntax to read individual items, that's, I think, the right approach. So what you do is you could say string word, and then you could say while I am able to read a word into there, do something with that word. Okay? That's all you need to do to read a file, a word at a time. So if I'm going to count up the unique words, a collection might be helpful. Why don't I keep a collection of all the words that I've seen? And then as I read each additional word, I'll store it in that collection, but only if I've never seen it before. Okay? So keep a collection of all the unique words. And again, what I said a minute ago was, uh, let's try to do it using the collections we've already seen. So let's do maybe using a vector. So maybe I'll say vector <laughs> of strings all words. Okay? So basically, I could say all words dot add word. Of course, that doesn't enforce the uniqueness that we want, right? So if I want to enforce the uniqueness, I would probably say something like, you know, if that word is not already in the vector, then add it, right? Okay, so let's check for that. Something like if it's not true that all words dot contains the word or something, contains word, okay, word, fine, then add the word. Okay, fine. There we go. And now uh, down at the bottom, I want to know how many unique words there are. I wrote zero, but I mean, how do I actually know how many unique words there are? The size, <laughs> right? The all words dot size is the number of unique words. And maybe just to be, you know, case insensitive, I'd say like word equals to lower case of word. You know, whatever. Just make sure the capitalization doesn't mess us up. Okay. And then I'll print how many milliseconds it took. So I'll compile this and I'll run it. And it's reading from the book Moby Dick, the complete text of that book. And we'll just wait a couple of minutes for this to finish. OK, it took 11 seconds to count 30,000 words. Is that a good amount of time? Is that a bad amount of time? It seems like it was kind of slow. It seemed like it took a while. But maybe that's just the fastest that you can do that. I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, is 11 seconds too much or not? Well, uh, spoiler, that's, that's not very good performance. <laughs> In particular, what if I try a different file that's even larger? Uh, like, let's try uh, the Holy Bible. So let's do bible.txt. I think it's the King James Bible. Um, so we run this. It's a bigger document. It has more words. And look, I'm not going to sit here and wait for it, but it's probably going to take like a full minute to read this file. Pretty slow. Okay, so I'll come back to this code in a second, but the point is there's a better data structure than a vector that would solve this problem more efficiently, and that's called a set. A set is a collection that doesn't store duplicates. If you try to add an item to a set that's already found in the set, it just doesn't add a second copy of it. It restricts that second copy from entering the set. And so the interesting thing about a set is that it doesn't support very many operations, but similar to the idea of <coughs> stacks and queues that we learned about on Wednesday, the few <coughs> operations that it supports, it supports them very efficiently. And so the core operations that a set can support are adding something, <coughs> removing something, and testing for whether something is present, asking whether something is in the set or not, which is often called contains. <coughs> Add, remove, contains. Now, you give up a lot of the other methods that you might have from like a vector. And in particular, we're going to give up indexed 
uh, examining of the vector. Like, you know, you loop over index i, you think of each element as having an index 0, 1, 2, 3, and you can refer to them in any order using those indexes. That's powerful, that's nice. In a set, you don't have that. There are no indexes, there's no int i, there's no looping over each element in that way. You just can't do that. And we'll talk about why that is in a second. But if you're willing to let go of that functionality, what's left is really fast in this structure. I know what you're thinking. I wonder if that program is done running. I wish he would alt tab back and see if the program is done running. Well, okay, I will. Uh, it, it is done, it took 21 seconds, I guess. So um, not, you know, not the longest time in the world, but it's pretty long. We'll come back to it. So in our library, there are two kinds of sets. Remember I talked on Wednesday about how there was a vector and a linked list and they supported basically the same operations, except they had a little different internal structure, which meant that some of the operations were faster or slower than others, remember that? And I called that, that was the concept of an ADT, different ways of implementing the same abstract operations. So there's a similar concept at work here with sets. There's two different types of sets in our library. One's just called a set, and the other one is called a hash set. And <clears throat> The differences between them are that the hash set is slightly faster, so that's good, but the hash set doesn't store the elements in any sort of predictable order, whereas the regular set stores the elements in a sorted order. So depending on what you're doing, you might prefer one of those over the other. If you're willing to sacrifice a little bit of speed to get a sorted order, maybe you want a regular set. If you don't care about order and you want to optimize for speed, you should pick a hash set. So um, after you've decided which one you want, you need to use certain operations. Here are the operations that the sets support. You have a question, yeah. <laughs> uh, question is, what is the order that the sort uses? Well, um, it depends on the data type. Most data types have some sorting order that's natural for them. Like integers are sorted by numerical order from smallest number to largest number. Strings are sorted by alphabetical ASCII ordering. Um, there are some data types that don't really have an inherent notion of ordering. Those types that don't have ordering cannot be put into a regular set and they must be put into a hash set. So yeah, that is an issue that comes up. But most of the data types that we would use with a regular set have some kind of order to them. Ints and doubles and cares and booleans and strings. They sort of have a natural order that, that is able to sort it. Um, I keep having these things on these slides where I show you the methods that say like O oh, something, <laughs> and I swear I'm gonna tell you what that means by the end of class today. It's something to do with the efficiency of the methods, but I'll come back to it. Um, these are the methods that a set supports. The main ones, as I said before, are add, remove, and contain. So those are the core operations. There's a few other things for convenience, but those first three are the most important ones. There's also some stuff for convenience like size is empty. You can print a set to see the contents of the set and so forth. Well, look, I want to go back to that program that we were writing. The program that took, what, 20 seconds to count the words in the Bible. Let's just go back, and all I want to do is um, change it so that instead of storing a vector of all the words, I'll make a set of all the words. Should I use a regular set or a hash set? What do you think? Well, we can try them both. I think maybe a hash set would be better because we don't really care what order the strings are stored in there. I just want to count them. As long as it counts them correctly, that's all I care about. So I'm not going to change any of the rest of the code because the hash set has an add method and a contains method and all that. So it has a size method. So the way that I was using it is actually not needed to be changed. I'll run it again and we're done. <laughs> 300 milliseconds, it's a lot faster. So, you know, Pepsi challenge, hash set wins. Um, Okay, what about the regular set? What if you just want uh, a regular set of words? <coughs> that one takes 700 milliseconds. It took twice as long, but it's still way faster than that vector, right? Okay, now you might say, well, what about that ordering stuff? I don't know if I understood that too well. Um, let me uh, pick a smaller input file. I don't know what this file is, but let me just change it to be like Marty step, Marty step. Ra, ra, ra. Okay, whatever. I just wanted to have repeating words, right? So um, small file, and then I go back to the document, and uh, I'll change it to read from small Moby. That's, that was originally an abridged form of the Moby Dick file. The original name of the file was not small Moby. 
But someone pointed out I should rename it to small mobile. You can think about that one. Um, so look, what I'm going to do here is, uh, is an innocent mistake, I swear. Um, in addition to printing out how many words there are and how long it took, I'm going to actually print out what the words are. It's too big to do that with the whole Moby Dick file, but I could do it here and just say C out uh, all words and all. So I can just print the collection. And what do I find? I find Marty and Ra and Step. It sorted them in alphabetical order because I used the regular set set. Um, and you know, just to make sure it's really clear that it did that, uh, let me go back here and say, you know, Abby, Clyde, Barney, uh, Mariana, that's my wife's name. So just put some names, some other words in there that are, that are uh, so now I think you can see that it's in alphabetical order, right? It's going from A to Z. That's related to your question about the sorting of the set. Now, if I go back and I switch it to a hash set, the hash set does not store the elements in any particularly predictable ordering. So if I rerun the same program with hash set, it's kind of just all jumbled up. Abby and Marty and then Clyde and then, it's just, it's not in sorted order. So if I care about that, I should use regular set. If not, I should use hash set. It, it says that it took zero milliseconds. There's so few words it can't detect the runtime. It's so fast, whatever, right? So that's kind of the quick usage of these collections and the methods that they provide. So it, they also provide some nice operators. You can ask if a set is equal to another set, if they have the same elements as each other. Um, you can do some like plus and times kind of stuff and minus, which does uh, what you might call set operations, like union, intersection, and difference, these kind of things, you know, to like merge two sets or intersect them or remove all of the elements from one set from another set, you can do that. Um, so, you know, there's just nice little operations like that that you can do on a set if you want to. I want to talk about some of the things that you cannot do with a set. Uh, where is it? You can't loop over a set with int i from zero to size. Okay? And we saw with um, stacks and queues, you also couldn't do that, right? And so what you had to do instead was you had to make a while, like, while not empty loop where you pull the elements out. You don't do that quite the same way in a set. With a set, you use what's called a for each loop. You say for each whatever in the collection you want to process that item. And the reason you have to do it that way is because there are no index operations on a set. So like if I wanted to print out all the words, I could come back here and say uh, for each string word in all words, I could see out here is a word plus word, word plus end all. And it would, uh, it would print them out, okay? So that's if you want to loop over a set, that's how you do it. And you know, when you're looping over a vector, you can start from zero and go to size. You can start from size and go to zero. There's lots of different orders you can use to go through the elements. Mostly when you're looping over a set, you're not supposed to be too concerned about what order you're looping over them. You can't really loop over the set backwards as easily. And I think the idea is if you care that much about loop orderings and stuff, maybe you should use a different collection. But anyway. Can't loop over it with index i. Um, any questions so far about set? What they can do, what they can't do? Yeah. Ah, question is about uh, something kind of buried on the slide that I didn't say. Um, it's kind of this like gray font to, to uh, de-emphasize. There technically is a third type of set called a linked hash set, which stores the elements in the order that you add them. So it's neither the randomness of a hash set, nor is it the sortedness of a regular set. It's the insertion order. But um, we don't use that one as often because it takes more memory and it's slightly slower. But it's perfect. If you want a set, but for some reason you care a lot about adding them in a certain order and you want them to stay in that order, you can use this linked hash set, third option. Any other questions? <coughs> I think the main thing is you have to be able to figure out when should I use each of these different structures. It depends what kind of problem that you're solving. I mean, sets are great for cases where you really don't want duplicates. You want to stop duplicates from getting into the code or you want to prevent them or, or you know you have a unique set of things. You know, if you, if you care, if you want to allow duplicates or, or you're not going to be doing a lot of searching, I think the, the core operation of a set is searching it for membership. Is this thing in the collection? That's very fast for a set, the contains operation. For a vector, how do you think a vector, you know, in the code that I had before, I used to have a vector here. 
and I called contains on the vector, and the program worked, but it was slower. How do you think the vector actually implements the contains code when I call into that? It's got 100 things in there, and I ask if this thing is in the vector, what's it do? What do you think? It just like internally does a loop over all the elements. Are you that thing? Are you that thing? Are you that thing? Yes? Okay. In, yes, it's contained inside of me. So yeah, it does what's called a sequential search where it loops over all the elements. So of course, the more elements that you have, the longer that that would take, right? Because you've got to loop over more stuff. You've got to search through more things to find the answer. And if we're processing a really big file, that vector is going to get really big. Every single time we read another word, I've got to look at the whole vector again to see if that word is in there or not. You can see how that would be slow. Of course, what I haven't totally made clear is somehow the set structure and the hash set structure don't need to spend so much time. They don't need to do so much work. They have different internal implementations that help them more quickly answer this membership question. I'm not going to teach you in great detail how they're implemented internally today. If you're super curious, the set is implemented using an internal structure called a binary tree or a binary search tree, we will learn about later. The hash set is implemented using an internal array structure called a hash table. We will also learn about that later in the course, but not today. If you want to Google them, you can. Any other questions about set? There's a particular uh, specialized collection called a lexicon. I don't think you really need to use it very much right now, but it's a set, but it only stores strings. You know, the set, you can say set of int, set of bool, set of care, set of string, set of anything. A lexicon doesn't ask for a type of value because a lexicon is implicitly a set of strings. Uh, you know, lexicon, if you don't know that word, it, just, it basically just means a dictionary without definitions. It's just a list of words that form part of a language. Um, so, a lexicon has almost exactly the same operations as a set, except that it only works on strings. It's meant to store a word, a dictionary of words. It has a few extra operations that involve prefixes that um, we're going to come back to this structure later in the class, but it's sometimes useful if what you're storing is strings of words or something like that. But a set of string is perfectly adequate as well. So I'm not going to really spend any time on this lexicon thing. Um, what I do want to talk about, though, is I want to talk about the next kind of collection that we'll do today, the sort of last major one we'll learn, which is called maps. So um, a map is sometimes also called a dictionary or a hash or a, um, an associative array or something like that. If you come from uh, 106 AJ, I don't remember what exact collections they, they introduced to you there, but you can use objects in JavaScript to store key value pairs in that language as well. If you took 106A here in Java, you probably learned about a structure called a hash map. That's this thing, basically. A map is a collection that stores pairs. Most collections that we've learned about store individual pieces of data called elements. You add something to the collection, right? So the difference between them is the order or the operations you could do or whether they have duplicates, but they store individual items. A map doesn't store individual items. It stores pairs. You add two things at a time. And the pairs have two parts to them. One part is called a key and the other part is called a value. So you add a pair and then later, if you supply the first part, the key, it will look up the second part, the value. And so the reason this is sometimes called like a dictionary is that that's actually a really good example of a thing you could use this structure for. If you stored pairs of words with definitions, then later, if all you had was a word, it would look up the definition that was associated with that word. That's what maps are for, associating pairs of data together. Okay? And sort of implicitly, they can do this quickly. You can look up things fast. So I have an example on the bottom of the slide of a set of pairs, which are phone numbers. You need to put a name, and the, the key, and the phone number for that person is the value. So you add all those pairs in, you've built yourself a phone book, and now later, if you want somebody's <laughs> phone number, you say, hey, Matt, look up the phone number for Marty, look up the phone number for Alicia, whoever, and they'll look it up. There's lots of examples of programming problems. Basically, whenever you want to look up something based on something else, that's usually a mapping problem. Maps are very useful structures. Uh, here are kind of the core operations that maps have. Basically, it's kind of similar to sets, actually. It's basically add and remove and search, although I, I use different verbs for those things. Adding something to a map is called put. So you put in a pair. You add a pair to the map. 
If there already was a pair with that key, it replaces that pair. So you can't have two pairs with the same key in them. They have to be unique keys. You can look up the value that's associated with a given key by calling get. So that's like, I have Marty's name. What is his phone number? Please look up the phone number. That's, that operation is called get. Our library, if you try to get the value for a key that isn't in the map, it'll return a default empty value of zero or empty string or whatever. Like in my example here, if you say get Eric, it'll return one, two, three, four, five, six, seven string. Uh, if you say get, uh, you know, Amy or somebody who's not in there, it'll return an empty string. Okay. And the last one is remove. You pass in a key and it will remove not only that key, but also the value associated with the key. So if I said remove, Marty, it would delete Marty and 6852181. Okay. Question, yeah. Does remove return the value? I forget. I don't remember. It differs from language to language, from library to library. I should know because I maintain these libraries, but I do not know. <laughs> uh, and so live, I will look it up. Uh, I think it's void. It is void. It doesn't return. So if you wanted to grab it and then also remove it, you would say get and then you would say remove. Maybe we should change the library. I don't know. How are we doing so far? Do you, do you have any questions about these core operations or about what a map is? I mean, I know a lot of you guys saw maps a little bit in 106A, so maybe this is somewhat familiar to you guys. Do you guys do anything with maps in 106AJ? Yes? Okay. Cool. <laughs> so you're saying maps make sense to you? Um, I'm never going to get tired of that joke. Okay, so that's what a map is. In our library, for C++, there are two kinds of maps. One is called map, the other one is called hash map. So you learned hash map in 106A if you took it in Java, so that should be a familiar name. It has a similar set of properties. Uh, these two structures, closely mirror the two types of sets, the set and the hash set. You have a map and a hash map. That's not a coincidence. It's actually because the way that they're implemented is very similar. Again, we'll talk about that later in the course, but a map, regular map, stores its pairs in a sorted order by the arrangement of the keys. So in my phone book example, the people's names would be the sorting order. It's not quite as fast, but it is sorted. The hash map is even faster, but it is completely unsorted. It's jumbled into a random order. So if you don't care about the order, you want to maximize the speed, you pick hash map. And I think you asked about a linked hash set. There is also a linked hash map. I don't think I put that on the slide here, but there is such a thing. <laughs> One interesting thing is when you declare the map, you write the two types of data in brackets. And this means every pair will consist of a key that's a string and a value associated with that key that's an int. Um, if you come from Java, Java makes you write different types here. Like instead of int, you have to say integer or something. We don't have to do that in C++. It's just you just write int or double or whatever. It just works. Okay. So here are the methods that you can do on a map. You can put, you can remove, you can ask to get the value for a given key. Size is empty, two string, all this kind of good stuff. Um, one thing I don't think I highlighted very much yet is that instead of saying get or put, you can just use the square brackets that makes it look like a vector or an array. Instead of saying get key, you can say map bracket key. That's actually much like JavaScript, I think, right? 106AJ, you can do that, so we can do that too. Um, so that's a nice shorter syntax. I'll probably use that in some of my code today, but either way is fine. Okay, so when you want to look at the values in a map, sometimes you want to loop over the map. Not always. Mostly maps are meant for looking up individual things one at a time, but sometimes you want to loop over the whole map. And if you do, <coughs> the for loop loops over the keys of the map. So I've got a map from strings to doubles, which is people and their grade point averages. Uh, and I'm making a lame joke about Berkeley, I guess, as well. And um, if you loop over the map, it gives you the keys strings, the names, and if you want the GPAs or the values associated with those names, you can call .get or you can use the brackets to look those up. So that's kind of how a for each loop looks on a map, okay? One thing you can do with maps is you can count things. You can tally things up. It's useful for that. Uh, like if you want to count up the votes for a given uh, election or something, 
you could loop over all the characters and you could associate R with a counter, counter of R votes and D with a counter of D votes and I with a counter of I votes. And as you grab each character out of the input, you could go as, you know, and store that in your map by uh, modifying the pair for that item. I'll show you how to do that in a second. But this kind of counting and tallying is something you do a lot with maps. It's kind of like a giant collection of counters, basically. Um, in fact, let's, let's look at that now, if you don't mind. Um, I want to go back to the reading words from a file, counting the words in a file. And what I want to do now is I don't just want to count how many words there are, like 50,000 words or whatever. I want to count how many occurrences there are of each unique word in the file. So if, the, if I'm doing Moby Dick, then the word whale occurs 187 times or whatever. And the word the occurs 556 times. I want to keep these individual counters for each of these words, OK? So I want to do that using a map. How does that work? Like, what does the map store in terms of pairs? <laughs> like, what are the types of things I'm going to store in the map? What do you think? Keys are words, okay, unique words. Great, what are the values associated with the keys? Great, great, the integer of how many times the word occurs. Okay, so, um, but we have to build up that structure over time. We have to read the file and use its data to build that information into our map, right? So imagine if you're walking across this file, you see to be or not to be. As I see each word, what do I do with the word? I think you've got exactly the right idea of what this map should store. Now, how do I read each word and turn it into that data? What do you say? When you go through each word, you check if it's already in the map, and if it's not, then you like, put P, and then what's the new value. And then every time you see a word, you like add, you like add one to the picture. Yeah, you've got the right idea. You said, um, as I read each word, look if I've got that word already in the map. And if not, I need to put it into the map. But if I do already have that word, I'm seeing one more occurrence of it. So I need to kind of increment or increase this count of how many times I've seen that word. So I think the idea would be like, uh, uh, so if I'm reading and I see to be or not to be or whatever, and I'm reading across that stuff, if I see the word to, you know, originally my map has nothing in it. But after that, after I read that word, I think what I want to store is like, I've seen the word to once, you know? So then I see B. And then I go, OK, well, now I've seen two once, and I've seen B once, right? So you're kind of doing that, and I guess I have or not. Well, whatever. Let's say the next word is two. <laughs> so uh, then what I do is I don't store another copy of two colon one. I store two colon two comma, you know, B colon one. You know what I mean? Like, put it in the map if it isn't there. But if it's in the map, go increase by one the int that is there, right? That's what you said. So just that's what I want to do as I read each word of this file using the structure you mentioned. So um, let's go to my project. I've got a file called maps.cpp. And I'm just reading a big file here. And I just took this part from the other file where I read the words one at a time. And so now I just want to fill in the part that uses the collection. So you told me to make a map of from strings to ints, maybe I'll just call it word counts or something. And then here, as I read each word, you said if it's not in the map, if the word is not in the map, add it. If it is in the map, increase its value by one, right? That's kind of what you said. So, okay, if uh, it's not, contained, there's a method called contains key. So if this key isn't in the map, what is the key? The words are the keys, right? So if this word is not found, add it. So word counts, the way you add is called put. What do I, what is the pair that I should put into the map here? Word comma one, right? I've now seen this word one time. I had never seen it before, but now I've seen it once. If it is in the map, then it's stored with some count, like three. And I need to go get that count and turn, change it into a four or whatever. I need to increase it by one, right? So the idea there is you say int count equals word counts dot get word. Go get, go look up the count for this word that I've already seen. Do count plus plus. 
uh, that does not modify the map. I have to put it back in the map with that new increased count. So word counts dot put word comma count. The increased, do you know what I mean? Like just asking for the count and plus plusing it doesn't modify the map. I have to go put it back in. Replace the old count with the new count. Okay? Yeah, question. Yeah, good question. Do I not need to remove the word? No. If you add a pair and the key from that pair is already found, it'll replace that existing pair for that word with this new pair for that word. Yeah. Yes. Can I like mush some of this together? Yeah, sure. I could. So first of all, I could get rid of this and say count plus one instead of plus plus. So now I'm down to two. But I could also say instead of this, this variable just comes from here. So I could say that. So like put its old value plus one in as its new value. But I could get even more stealthy with it, which is I could say, you know, instead of saying dot put, you actually can use this shorter syntax where you say um, word counts bracket word equals one. That's equivalent to saying put word and one in as a pair. So that works. That doesn't shorten the code below, but that, that syntax works. You could also do something similar here where you said word counts bracket word equals word counts bracket word plus one. Like put it in with its old value plus one, right? But you could shorten that to plus equals one or to plus plus. So that's shorter. And if we're deleting things, if the word isn't there, you can actually plus plus it anyway, and it'll just turn it from a zero to a one. So you can just do that. <laughs> that works because if the word isn't there and you try to plus plus it, it'll silently add it with a zero count, plus plus it to a one, and that's what you wanted in the first place. I think that short version is a little harder to understand for a new programmer, so I'm gonna put it back. <laughs> but if you're cool and you are okay with that syntax, that's fine with me, whatever is fine. <laughs> it's a cute little, little shortening of the code there. Hey, I never ran it yet, so I count up all the words, and then what I wanted was like, after I'm done counting them, I wanted to make it so you could type in a word to search for, and then I would print out the count. So something like int count equals word counts dot get word, whatever word you type, and then I'll print count times. So let me just run it real quick. Um, so, oops, <laughs> I'm running the wrong file. Uh, sorry. Uh, so if I go to sets, uh, Let's change this to totally not main, and then maps should be renamed to say main, main maps. Okay, let's try that. And it's reading the contents, and so it's finished. I didn't do the timer, but you could see it was pretty fast, right? It took about a second or so. Word to search for in Bible, let's type the. That's a lot of times. God, devil, John. Whatever, right? It is, and so I mean, it, I'm not positive. I didn't. That's not a good test case. Like I, I don't know if those counts are right. I, I should actually test it with smaller files to make sure it's working. But I'm pretty sure that's the right code. Um, so maps are great for looking this stuff up. It's got a bunch of data of all these counters, and we can look up the counter for any given word. How about Martin? Oh, that's my name, and not in there at all. Mariana, my wife's not in there either. That's too bad. Um, so yeah, any questions about that example? Yeah. Oh yeah, you know one thing that I'm just ignoring is if there are punctuation marks like uh, hello comma, it would include the commas in the string of the word. And so hello comma would be counted separately from hello regular. And so that's actually a flaw. What I would have to do would be like here, after I lowercase the word, I'd have to like filter out characters that I don't like. Um, I chose not to do that just because I didn't care too much about that detail. But you're right, if I really wanted a good version of this, I would want to strip <coughs> punctuation marks. This program does have that issue right now. You're right. You also said hash, and I want to point out, I used a regular map here, 
it would have been just fine to use a hash map because I didn't really care about the way that it was all sorted in the structure. I just wanted to be able to look up individual words counting later, right? So hash map would probably be slightly better for this particular example. It doesn't compile because up here I didn't include the hash map.h, but I can do that. Hash map.h. Now it should run. And I don't think you'll really notice much difference. I think it just slightly prompted up faster with that version. Uh, seems to have the same counters and stuff. <laughs> the first time I ever taught this class at Stanford, I was giving this example, and I ran the thing, and I said, okay, let's search for some words in the Bible. And I typed in God, and it said, like, two. And I typed in devil, and it said, like, one. And I typed in Jesus, and it said zero. And I'm like, uh... <laughs> What version of the Bible is this? I thought Jesus appeared more than once in the Bible. I could be wrong, depends, you know. And it turns out I was using the Moby Dick file. <laughs> and I'm like, there's a lot of whales in the Bible for some reason. I don't get it, I don't know. Anyway, fun times. Uh, so look, I mean, I think you've maybe seen maps a little bit before, possibly, or some structure that's equivalent to a map if you took 106 AJ, but I mean, like with all of these structures, I think it's important to be able to identify when should I use this structure. When, if I just give you a problem and I say use a vector, that's fine. But if I give you an open problem and I don't tell you what structure to use, how do you know what structure to use? And I think that you need to practice that thought process. And one of the things about maps is you say, well, I need to associate each of this kind of thing with a, that kind of a thing. I need to associate things with each other. I need to look up things based on another value. Use this value to get that value. That's exactly the sort of associational relationship that should lead you to say, oh, I probably need a map for that. Um, there was a question. Yes, go ahead. Why did I change the main? Because in the same project, I have multiple files with a main function. And when you compile a project, it just mushes them all together. And so if two of them have a main function, they actually like collide and it says you have multiple definitions of main. And so I have to just rename one of them so that there's only one function called main in any given project. So, yeah, that, that's why. It's just a C++ uh, project limitation, basically. In one overall project, you cannot have two functions named main with the same parameters and stuff, right? Especially main is important because it's the one that it runs. So in order for it to know where to start running, there has to be one unique function named int main. Yeah, another, was there another question? <laughs> yeah. So I'm not sure I heard you right. This is what uh, the question is about the lexicon. It's, you said is it like a vector? It's more like a set of strings. It only stores uh, unique strings. You can add, remove, and ask if it contains stuff. So it has those kind of same core operations. It stores in a sorted order, like a set set. It has a few operations that are distinct. It has what's called a prefix search. So you can say, does any word in this set start with mar? And if the set contains Marty or Mariana, it would return true. So sets, lexicons are useful for those kinds of questions. Yeah? Yeah, um, I'm going to give you a short answer just because I want to stay in scope of ADTs and collections and stuff. His question is like, if I have these multiple files in my project and they have a function with the same name in both files, it will give me this error like the multiple definition of the same function. So in Java or another language, you might get around that by saying private or something to keep them separate from each other. Um, C++ does have things of private and public, but it only has that if you write classes. And currently, we aren't writing classes. We're just writing bare functions. If you have bare functions and you want them to not collide, there is a word that you can use called static that's a sort of like private where now they can both have a similar function name. I don't normally recommend this because it makes the debugger not understand as well what the function's name is and what it's doing. So if you get a crash, it doesn't print you a very good trace of the function headers and lines and stuff. So I would say for now, if you have multiple files in your project, you just sort of name them with distinct function names. But we will talk about all of that later on when we do classes and objects and private and public and that kind of stuff. <coughs> right. Um, I want to show you a few more things before we're done. So uh, I'm only going to spend a second on this, but you can 
nest collections. So you can have like a vector of sets. You just sort of declare the type of element of the vector as being set of ints. So it's a vector of sets of ints. You can have maps of stacks, and you can have vectors of queues, and you can nest these things inside of each other. Sometimes that's exactly what you want. You don't need to read all this code in detail here, but like if you wanted to keep a set of people's buddy list on uh, Messenger, <laughs> I don't know why I have an AOL icon. <laughs> How old is that slide? But um, a set of buddies, how do you keep a track of everybody's buddy list or friend list or whatever? Well, if you said, hey, who are Marty's <coughs> friends? It's like, I know the name of the person I'm interested in, Marty. I want, in exchange for that name, I want the friends that he has. So it's like I want to associate the name of a string with a collection of friends. So I want to have a mapping from strings to sets of other strings. So it's a map of string, comma, set, string. And so you can add in all these friends here. And so Hal is friends with Marty, and Jim is friends with these people, and Marty is friends with these people. And you, you know, all of the things I've been teaching you still work, still apply, if you have a collection inside of a collection or a collection of collections. Syntax can get a little weird looking. All these plus equals is, most of our collections support plus equals as a synonym for dot add. So it's basically the same as saying dot add. Um, I only have a few minutes left, and so I'm only going to, you know, start to cover the topic today. But I want to talk about uh, something called big O notation, algorithm analysis. So I'm going to give you a short version of this, and I'll resume speaking about it on Monday. It has to do with those little things on the columns of my, my method tables where I said, oh, something, you know? You can talk about the efficiency of code in different ways. I want to show you an example of code. Look at this example. And now some of the part just says statement one, statement two, statement three. It, my point there is it doesn't matter what the statement is. If you look at that code and you want to talk about how many statements will it execute in total, well, there's this reference to a variable named n, and I didn't tell you what the value of n is. But we could describe the total code execution in terms of n as a variable. If you look at those two for loops, each of them goes from one to n, right? And they're nested inside each other. So overall, it's going to run n squared, n times n total statement, right? And then that second loop only has one loop up to n, but it has three statements inside of it. So it's sort of n repetitions of three. So it's n times three things, right? And so that's sort of like this piece of code sort of does n squared plus three n plus one statements roughly. That's not a perfect description because as the loop is going, it's doing plus pluses and stuff. And so that's not a perfect counter, but that's a, an idea, right? And so the thing that I want you to notice about this is if the value of n gets bigger, like if it goes from 10 to 1,000, what you'll see is that that n squared loop really starts to hurt you, doesn't it? <coughs> In terms of your runtime. Because you have 1,000 times 1,000 times 1, you get a million statements now if n is a thousand. If it were triple nested loops, it would be a billion or whatever, right? So the more repetitions, the more loops you have, the longer that things will take. So when we look at the collections that we've studied, if you think of the collection as having n elements in it, like a vector of n elements, if you talk about an operation that you want to perform on the vector, if you want to add something to the end of a vector, it just puts it there. That doesn't take very long, right? But if you want to add something at the start of the vector, it has to shift all the elements over, right? We talked about that. If you have to shift over n elements, that's roughly saying that it's going to take you n statements, n commands, to add something at the front of a vector, right? Versus if you add something at the end of a vector, you don't do any shifting, and so it sort of only takes you one statement. You just put it there. You're just done. It might not literally be one. It might be too few, but it's, it's not very many, right? So we sometimes talk about, I'm going to jump to a slide. Oops. Gonna jump. I know I only have a minute left here, but <clears throat> what we do is we sometimes talk about these methods where we say this thing takes around n statements to execute. If you want to ask whether something's empty, that takes only about one or two statements. That's fast. If you want to remove something, I have to shift people. So that takes more like n times. If I want to insert something, that has to shift people. So that takes n times. So if I say O of n, O of 1, I'm saying it's on the rough order of taking n statements to run for a collection that contains n elements. 
This is shorthand for is it fast or is it slow? <laughs> if it takes one, it's fast. If it takes n, it's slow. And you might say, well, but doesn't it not always take n? Sometimes removing from different indexes takes less than n. I'm speaking about an average. <coughs> so if you remove from lots of different places, most of them will take close to n in order to execute. So those tables with those things are trying to tell you which methods are fast, which methods are slow. We care about that as programmers. So I'll resume talking about that more on Monday. Have a great weekend. See you guys next time.